After Computex 2017 in Taiwan, both AMD and Intel announced their high-end desktop architectures, namely the X299 and X399 architectures. Now, Intel have already introduced their $1,000 7900X CPU, which I've already reviewed here on the channel. And despite all the drawbacks and flaws of that CPU, it still did have a place in today's enthusiast market. However, this brings us today to the 1950X, which is a CPU that comes in at just under $1,000, 999 US to be exact. It features 16 cores, 32 threads, and I've found that this CPU that I have here was able to be overclocked to 4 gigahertz across all those cores. Not only that, the CPU out of the box comes clocked in at 3.4 gigahertz, so it is pretty decent out of the box for 16 cores, 32 threads, especially for those guys who want to come from a dual Xeon workstation, for example, and are thinking about upgrading to a platform such as X399. However, I'm gonna roll those benchmarks for you and then we're gonna talk about the main differences between these two CPUs. Looking at the test bench specs used for this comparison, we have the X399 Gaming Professional from ASRock. This is a board that worked perfectly out of the box and without this motherboard, I wouldn't be able to do this comparison. So big thank you to ASRock for this motherboard. It currently costs around $440, or if you're in Australia, around about 670 AUD. So I'll put the links in the description below for that. And then lastly, for the cooling solution, we're using the H100 IV2 from Corsair. Now we had to actually change the bracket around from the stock bracket to the included bracket for Ryzen. And since this is an Ace Tech based circular model, it was able to fit with ease. However, keep in mind that other coolers may have problems fitting to the X399 platform. And the H100 was the only cooler that I could use. So the benchmarks, as always, do all the talking. And what we saw with the 1950X was a CPU that kicked a lot of ass when it came to productivity. And when we go through the list, we had 7-Zip, Cinebench, Prezonus, Adobe, Excel, POV, Ray. All these situations showed that the 1950X was beating the 7900X, both at its stock speeds and its overclocked speeds. And that was really good because for $1,000, if you're spending this amount of money on a CPU, then you probably will want it to perform really well in productivity. I'd imagine someone who has the money to spend both on the CPU and the more expensive motherboard costs, which we'll get onto a bit later in this review, I'd imagine if you're spending that amount of money, you'd want to be saving time, where the absolute performance and that price performance premium over something like a Ryzen 7 7700 and a B350 motherboard, for example, is justified because that amount of time you're saving is gonna be worth more than the additional cost of the 1950X. However, another thing I decided to do with this review was throw in gaming benchmarks and also streaming benchmarks. And we can see with the streaming benchmarks that the 7900X does have a place in today's market. If you're a streamer and your life revolves around streaming day in and day out, then the 7900X is probably gonna be the best CPU for you. However, keep in mind you can still stream and game on the 1950X. It's a perfectly playable experience. And if you guys watch my 7900X review, you realize that that didn't pull ahead really of the, even like the Ryzen 7 1800X, 
which is under half the cost and similar to the Ryzen 7 7700. And also the 7700K did score a lot of victories when it came to gaming. So if your only experience is with gaming and all you wanna do is play games, then the 7700K is gonna be a better buy for you than both of these CPUs. And another thing to mention is a Ryzen 7 7700 can be had for under $300, and a B350 motherboard can be had for under $100, and together that makes just one absolute kick-ass performance PC for streaming and even doing things like Adobe Premiere Pro 4K video editing. So really, when it comes down to it, the 1950X is one of those CPUs that you will wanna get when you need to save time. And of course, that is an absolute must on your priority list. So also, before I get on out of here, I wanted to talk about the 1950X and some of its behavioral traits, especially overclocking, which I know a lot of you guys will probably wanna get this CPU and maybe even put it underwater, overclock it and see how it goes. So for this testing, I did use a H100i from Corsair. And it was really the only cooler I had around here that fitted with the bracket. I believe it's a stock Acetec circular bracket that you can put on and it does need a new mounting system. So X399's alignment of bolts are different to any other architecture out there. So keep in mind though, if you are buying the CPU and you wanna get a cooler for it, just keep in mind that it does come with a bracket, but if you are using one of those coolers, then you will need to go find a cooler that supports this bracket or you will need to go get a new custom water block for Ryzen X399. Of course, you can use an air cooler as well, which will work out of the box, but keep in mind the power consumption is considerable even at stock settings. So we had 173 watts out of the box with Ryzen when it was stressed in Ida 64. So of course, that is a lot of heat to keep under the hood, but one thing to remember is of course, again, 16 cores, 32 threads at four gigahertz. Now, one thing I will talk about as well with the overclocking behavior of this CPU is the actual uh, extra millivolts needed to get this to four gigahertz. For instance, 3.95 gigahertz, I was able to boot up and run all my tests at 1.31 volts. When I went up to four gigahertz, I needed an extra 30 millivolts in order to get that overclock stable and running. And of course, with that was a lot of extra power consumption and a lot of extra heat. So if you guys are buying this CPU, I'd recommend tuning it to its sweet spot and finding out where those diminishing returns really kick in. And in the case of Ryzen, it's usually between 3.8 and 4 gigahertz. The 1950X, of course, being no different as the other smaller variants. And another thing that was interesting is the pricing of both these CPUs. The 1950X is coming in at a suggested retail price, which is great. The 7900X is coming in $40 cheaper. I guess that's due to less demand, possibly than the 1950X that's coming in at 960 US. And in Australia, this pricing is kind of following through a little bit as well with the 7900X costing 1,340 Australian and these 1950X costing 1,400 Australian. There is the cheaper 1920X, which is 12 cores and 24 threads, which is going for 1,100 AUD. And in the US, that's going for around 800 US. But one thing that interests me the most was the motherboard costs. The X399 chipset variants were actually more expensive on average than the X299 variants. I'm not sure why this is. Perhaps that massive socket does add in extra cost to the board manufacturer costs. Because in America, the cheapest X399 board I could find was around 360 US. The cheapest X299 board I could find was about 260 US. And in Australia, this was the same deal with 400 AUD versus 500 AUD respectively. Also, two pretty big factors to consider when buying a 1950X versus a 7900X is the fact that the 1950X has 64 PCIe 3.0 lanes available and the 7900X has 44 lanes available. Also with the X399 chipsets, a lot of the times ECC memory will actually work on this platform. As with X299, it actually won't work. I believe you have to get the C442 Xeon chipset and that of course with ECC memory will only work with Xeon CPUs. So now it's time for that final verdict where I'm gonna tell you guys which I think is better in what scenario. And the 1950X is for that person who needs those cores and needs those threads. You can get it up to four gigahertz 
And as you saw on the Cinebench, the max theoretical performance out of this thing is absolutely incredible. So if you need the cores, you need the threads, and you need it for those workstation or productivity applications, then 1950X Threadripper CPU is going to kick a lot of ass. The 7900X, however, of course, it doesn't perform as well because it only has 10 cores and 20 threads, though it does have better IPC and it does clock higher. And I found for someone like a streamer, it still does have a place in the market. Of course, though, I will stress this before I get on out of here. Both these CPUs are very expensive investments. So you will want to know which one is best for you before you pull the trigger on either of these CPUs. And also another thing with the 1950X and its gaming performance, it wasn't bad at all. You could still play games perfectly fine with the 1950X and get a very enjoyable experience. And even today's GPU, the 1080 Ti, is geared up towards higher resolutions. I just deliberately tested it at lower resolutions for people, of course, that want to know everything about these CPUs. However, if you're into 4K gaming or 1440p gaming, and you're getting it with a high-end GPU like a 1080 Ti, then the gaming performance is going to be completely fine. So anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's review of the 1950X and the comparison against the 7900X. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button and let me know in the comments section below if you had a choice between getting a 1950X and a 7900X, which would you get and why? Love reading your comments as always, and I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.